First of all, thank you so much for coming, Ellie, and being patient with us here. Please, can you guys help me give Tyra a round of applause again? Thank you. Thank you. I don't take your time for granted at all, so I really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been yeah. looking forward to this for a long time. Awesome. You know, you're one of the OGs, so oh, wow. we have to do this right. <laughs> So because it's a live interview, I'm going to do my typical YouTube intro. Um, <clears throat> are you guys ready for me? I don't like this ginger. Are you guys ready for me? <laughs> wow, a little too much. Hi, guys. My name is PC Timmy, and I welcome to another episode of Founders Connect, but this time live. <laughs> um, on Founders Connect, I have amazing conversations with entrepreneurs and operators in the African tech ecosystem, and we just learn about their journey to what they were building and learn a bit about the company as well. There isn't a lot of stories about founders and who they are specifically, not just how much money they are fundraising. As so our Founders Collect was sp spotlighting these amazing stories. Now with this episode live, I'm having a conversation with Tyo Biosu. He's the founder and CEO of Paga, he has been building Paga since 2009. So one of the pioneers in everything FinTech as we know it today. So sit back, listen, watch, um, and you have your comments ready at the end of this session. Hi again, Tyra. Hi, Peace, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this event um, and to sitting with you. So um, let's go, let's okay. do it. Okay, first question, Des describe yourself in three words. Wow. Um, so I, the way I, I, I like to think of myself as a very simple bushman, actually. <laughs> bushman. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm a very simple person. I like them down to earth. Um, and, you know, I'm very curious and um, very passionate about making change in the world happen. Um, and, and I think that's what motivates me is that I want to know that, um, you know, on my deathbed, I want to know that I did something that was of difference to the world. Um, and that it would live beyond me. And that's like the big thing that drives me. But, but, I'm, but I'm, I say I'm a Bushman because even though English is my first language, there are many words I don't know. So like, <laughs> when I hear these guys use big words, I'm like, what? Like, you know? So uh, my favorite um, tool on my iPhone is a lookup. I oh, literally okay. highlight the word and I look up. <laughs> like, that's so a really that good mean? one. That's a really good way to yeah. learn. I do it all the time as well. All the time. <laughs> okay, so how did you... I almost wanted to ask how did you come about, but that's such a weird question. <laughs> but really what I want to know is sort of like your background story. Like we yeah. know you now as Paga, um, but you were not always the founder of Paga. Um, so what bush did you come from, for instance? What year were you born? But just give me a sure, bit about like sure. your background story. So I, my mom once, my late mom once sat me down and um, told me the story of how I came about. <laughs> which basically is that my father chased her for a year plus, hit, you know, really hitting on her, trying to like, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you know, I think back in those days there were no condoms, right? So I think like a woman, <laughs> frankly, a woman having sex is like, you know, you're preparing to possibly get pregnant, <laughs> right? Like, um, so, you know, then she's like, oh yeah, I finally agreed. And I was really looking, she had already four boys. She's like, I was really looking forward to a girl. And then you showed up. I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> thanks mom. <laughs> she's like, but I love you. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, like, I'm the last of five boys, um, single parent family, um, and I think that really shaped me. Uh, my mom uh, was, a, was an entrepreneur, and I, after she worked for government, she, she started many businesses on her own. In fact, when she came back to the house telling us she was resigning from the federal government, um, you know, she was like, and, and we're living in VI at the time, she was like, and we're moving to Yanapaja, right? Um, so for all of us, it was like, whoa, we're going to leave all our friends and all that kind of stuff. We had grown up in 1004. And, um, but it was a really uh, instrumental time in my life, uh, spending several years living in Yanapaja and, and growing up, getting to see another part of Lagos and another part of livelihood that I had not experienced before. Uh, and I think those things actually really shaped me. Later so when you say they life. really shaped you, how did they shape you? Yeah, I think, it, I, think I, I got to learn at a young age, because we moved when I was 10, I got to learn at a very young age being comfortable with what we have mm. and not having a lot. <laughs> and being comfortable with not being able to afford the generator that gives us light, and so we have to be in darkness, right? And we can only have light when there's nepa, right? Um, and still having a happy 
life, enjoying my friends, going to friends' houses that had things more than I did, right? I was actually commenting to, I was talking with my friend this weekend about, um, oh, sorry, this week, about how I play PlayStation a lot, and I was like, oh wow, as a kid, I never had any of that stuff. I used to have to go to other people's houses to play, to play. Um, and until I could afford for myself, I never had a, any sort of device. And um, so I think that experience of, and my mom really helped us, you know, instill in us that we have to work hard um, and that we should also not look um, or think that where we are is defining of our future. Yeah, right. that's, a, that's a really great lesson. So what was school like? Now, now I know that you grew up in, in Anipaja for a bit, but what schools did you go to and what did you study as well? Yeah, so... For primary school, I went to Corona VI and then to Bagada. Um, and then I went to Nigerian Navy Secondary School in Ojo. Anyone from Navy Secondary School in the house? Anyone? No? Somebody right no, there. No one. All right, we got one. Awesome. Um, and that was, man, that was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so I was in boarding school. And for the first year, I fought it. I mean, we were drilled. I was also in the cadet. So, so that was uh, real building discipline. Right. Uh, so I think that real built a lot of discipline. I mean, one of my funniest experiences in boarding school, the first, I think it was maybe the second semester, um, I decided to, you know, I was done with, with, the, with the boarding. And so I, I walked out with some of the day students, right? And I actually made it out. They didn't catch me. <laughs> so I was really excited. I found, got on bus. I went back home. And when my mom got home, she was so mad. She, ah, man, she whooped me. And then she packed me into the car, took, took me back. <laughs> but get this, when we got towards the gate, before you get into the gate of, um, of the big estate where the, where the school was, she told me to jump in the back and lay down flat. So she got to the gate and said she was going to see Mr. Laiwala, who's the, um, the, the, uh, one of the housemasters. So they let her in. Then along the way, she stopped for me to come out and she run back into my dorm room. So I go back into my dorm room, and then she went and asked for me. <laughs> so that they call me. <laughs> so, I mean, like, without telling me anything, that taught me another lesson. What was that? That, you know, A, she's going to punish me for doing something wrong, but she's got my back. Mm. She's also going to be there to protect me. Right, um, and and I really I really loved that. Oh, your mom sounds so sweet. Yeah, she was. She was. <laughs> I mean, so I know that you started Paga when you moved back to Nigeria at some point. So I want to know where you moved from. So what was that journey to? Or I was somewhere living before, and then I came back to Nigeria, and then I started Paga. Yeah. So I I left for the U.S. Um, probably the right after you know when Babangida the whole Babangida era ended and Abacha, et cetera. I left right around the beginning of people leaving. Um, and, I, and I left by myself. Um, my mom was able to give me $5,000, which is all she gave me, um, and, you know, and worked my way through university, uh, doing several jobs. Um, I was a janitor. I was, um, you know, I worked at the bank as a teller. I washed houses. You know, I did, I did several things. But anyways, when I finished university, um, I ended up working in consulting. I worked for a startup, first of all. That didn't work well. I got fired um, <laughs> after three months. That was a real interesting experience for me. And then um, I went to consulting. Did that for about three years, then business school. Uh, then I went to work for Cisco in the acquisitions and venture team. Now, after about three years at Cisco, I was having the itch to do something entrepreneurial. Um, at Cisco, my role was in venture and acquisition, so I'd been around a lot of startups, and also at Stanford University, where I did my MBA. Um, I'd been around a lot of startups, and, and so I actually come up with an idea that I was going to start for the US. Right. Uh, and I was exploring that idea, but at the same time, I was working on a project for Cisco in South Africa. So this was the first deal that we're doing in Africa and I was leading that for them. So from San Francisco, I was going to South Africa at least once a month. And my friends who were there started encouraging me to think about coming back home. And one of them, Fred Swanica, who's the founder of the African Leadership Academy, African Leadership Network, um, said to me something that really hit home to me. He said, you know, Nigeria felt to him like where India and China were 15 years before. Now you have to remember this was in 2007. And he said it felt to him like, 
you know, if you look at where India and China were 15 years before, um, you'd seen steady growth, and Nigeria had already had five years of democracy now, um, and easier to do business. Mm -hmm. So it says, imagine the people who were in India 15 years ago and what their, what their businesses are today. So it's Tata, Infosys, Accelometal, and those are now not just Indian conglomerates, but they're global names. Um, and it says that's the opportunity you have if you go back to Nigeria. You would not just make a difference in Nigeria, but you can make a difference in the world. Uh, but you can have a cushy life in the US if you want, right? Um, so that really stuck with me. And, and later that summer, I was um, in Bhutan, which is the one place in the world I would highly recommend you to find a way to visit one day. It's probably the most beautiful place in the world that is not on a beach. Um, and I was in Bhutan overlooking, you know, these beautiful hills and mountains, meditating, and made a decision to move back to Nigeria, right? Um, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know anything, but um, I made that decision that I was going to quit my job and, and move, move back to Nigeria to be part of the economic redevelopment of Nigeria. I have two questions. Mm. The first one was, you mentioned that one of your first jobs, you were fired after three months. Yeah. I want to know the story <laughs> and maybe what you took out of it because you also yeah. mentioned that it was very pivotal for you. Yes. Um, and the second question is, you say you, you go meditating and you decide I'm going to move back to Nigeria, but you didn't know what you were coming for and you're going to quit a really good job. Yeah. It, was it because you had like a fallback? Like maybe you had some money or like, because that's a very daring decision to yeah. say. Some people say, oh, I want to go build this, and I want to build it in Nigeria, so they move back. But to say, well, let life lead, that's, that's very bold. So how did that happen as well? Yeah. Um, so the first one, um, you know, right after undergrad, I got this job uh, in L.A. working for a, for a startup that is now, you know, still exists and is doing really well. And what they were building at the time or the digital imaging chips that you're probably using in your cameras today. Um, and, you know, I had majored in electrical engineering and I had, and I had uh, of all the subjects in electrical engineering, the one that I struggled with the most with, that I got B's on, was... Um, B's semi was a struggle? Yeah, B was a struggle, right? Um, was semiconductor chip design. And so, you know, and that was the one that I said, let me go and get a job in, rather than the one I was getting A's and A pluses in that I was great at. So I really struggled at the job. I worked weekends. The, C the CEO was very nice and was helping me, like, you know, learn, et cetera. Everybody was very helpful. It was a team of eight people. Um, and, you know, and I remember finally, like, one of my first chip that was sent to Taiwan to be made came back and it wasn't working. I was like, man, this guy just spent all this money. Um, so one day they called me in and fired me, um, and I literally started crying in front of this guy, right? Like, um, and it was just, and I lived with like 10 people at the time in a massive house. So I was just like the whole way home, I'm like, I'm just, I, just, I just graduated college, I'm my first job, I've been fired after three months. I was really distraught. Um, you know, and, and after that I, I went to, you know, I had to make ends meet. So I was on unemployment in California for one month where they give you money. Um, and then I started doing menial jobs, right? Postal jobs and stuff like that just to make ends meet. But I then started looking for other, other jobs as well on campus. So eventually I got the job to go to Deloitte. But anyways, well, you fast forward to when I was at business school at Stanford, I called my boss and I thanked him for firing me because I was in the wrong role. I was not in a place that was using my strengths. I was actually struggling. So the big lesson for me um, and which I still take with me everywhere and I apply at PAGA, is to make sure people are in the role that fits for them, right? Uh, where their strengths can really be used and where they can fly, right? It doesn't make sense, like, and I use football as an analogy, you know, go Chelsea, right? Uh, all the time. Uh, <laughs> of Chelsea. So I use football as an analogy. You're not going to put the striker as the goalkeeper. The striker could probably save a few balls, but they're not gonna put them as a goalkeeper. So for everyone on your team, you wanna make sure that they're in the place that is best for their strengths, and that's how it works. So that's been the big, that was a real big, big learning for me. And that makes sense because for talents, they can also say, oh, and I should also optimize for places that I can try if I know my strengths and I can optimize for that. Correct. Um, so the other question was around, you moved without having a plan. 
Okay, what so made you bold enough to do that? So I actually didn't move without a plan, to be okay. fair. I mean, I decided to move without a plan. Okay. Then I started looking for what, what it would be. Um, and, I, and I came back, came to meet with different companies, and then got the offer to join a private equity firm. Right. Right. So I actually did have that plan. However, what I did, um, which was really tough, is that I moved everything. I did not leave anything behind in the U.S. Um, and so that was scary because here I had built, a, in the U.S., I built a great life, great connections. Um, and I was going to, and I was worried that because I didn't go to university in Nigeria, I didn't have a network. Right. Um, and so I was really worried about that. But so I, but I left everything behind. And, uh, you know, and for me, the, the way I thought about it was like, look, the very worst case if this job doesn't work out is I could start something. In the very worst case, if that doesn't work out, I could go back to the U.S. So right. I did feel like I had some a, sort a of backup plan. Backups, yeah. Right. But you made it hard to go back because you moved everything. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. How, did, how did you discover the problem that Paga is solving and how did you start it up? Yeah. So in, 2000, in 2008, when I, when, I started my, when I moved back and I started working, every Friday, someone would go around the office and get and ask us to all write checks to get the cash that we needed for the weekend. And everywhere was cash. You go to the ATM, ATM is not working. And I remember going on a date once, and, I, and at the end of the date, I tried to pay with my card. It didn't work. They brought two other machines. It didn't work. I had to leave my date there and go to the third ATM before I actually got cash, came back and paid. You know? And I was like, this is just ridiculous, right? We have to solve payments. We have to make it easy for anyone to pay and get paid. And, and this really got me, and I was around that time I was looking at different ideas. And so what really came to me was like, we have to make financial freedom possible. So Paga was inspired by dates. <laughs> Paga was inspired by many <laughs> things, but including a date. Um, now that, you know, that, that, you know, you didn't go anywhere with that girl, but, <laughs> but Paga came out of this, which is, which is useful, you know, and it was a useful use case. Um, so, you know, so really for us, what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to make, bring financial freedom to Africans, make it simple for a billion people to access and use money, right? Like, that's just sort of what really drove me. Very simple, Misha. I'm a very impactful. Yeah. It's been a long time, 2009 yeah. or 2008? Yeah, we started in 2009. We worked for three years straight without any revenue. Um, thank goodness for our investors who believed in it. Where it's probably the hardest three years I've ever worked, actually. Um, and then in 2012, August of 2012, we launched to the public. Um, yeah, so it's been an it amazing took you journey. It three years to actually build and launch. It took what was happening at three years? We were building. Every day we were working till almost 10 p.m. almost every night. Like, um, and, you know, it's, it, it, the time flew by, to be honest. Like, because initially we were building in stealth, and then finally people sort of knew what we are doing. Um, and we were applying for the license. It took us two and a half years to get the license from the central bank. Right. Uh, but the product, the first, from when we said go on building product to having a working product, it took us six months. Right. Uh, and I remember, I still remember very clearly the first time um, I used Paga and it worked, right? So I have to take you guys back, right? One of the first things we built on was SMS. So you could send money by SMS, and you could pay your bills, you could buy airtime just by sending a simple SMS. And when you sent that SMS, you got a call back, an automated call. Hi, this is Paga. We are calling to confirm a transaction of 1,000 Naira to phone number, blah, 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 right? Please press yes to enter your PIN to confirm. So I, you know, I sent the text, I, my phone rang immediately, I heard highs, but I just screamed, right? And I was the only one upstairs. We're in a two-story um, house, duplex. And Jay, my co-founder, was like, is everything okay? Is everything okay? <laughs> and I'm like, it worked. It worked. <laughs> like, you know? Um, but it was just really exciting to see it, see it working. Um, but yeah, but it took us that long. And, and I think that's different now, yeah. right? Um, and, and the other thing that we're doing was raising capital, right? So that's also different now. It's a bit easier today, yeah. right, to raise capital. Okay, that makes sense. So one of the things that I think about when I think about Paga is you've been building for a long time, right? Um, there are many new fintech companies that are like two years old, three years old, but Paga has been there since 2009. I, I wasn't even, I wasn't probably in secondary school in 2009. Let's not talk, let's not age ourselves here. 
So that's a long time. Um, how have you managed to stay consistent and in existence for this long as a fintech company? What do you think has been the things that you have done that said, oh, even though the tides are changing, new companies are coming up, digital bank is this, ESS, like they've been, you've gone through different phases of what fintech looks like in Nigeria. How have you just stayed for this long? Yeah, um, I mean, the word fintech didn't exist, right, when, when, when we started. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, I got an opportunity to meet uh, Steve Case, the founder of AOL uh, in Nairobi, and had a great experience meeting him. And then he came to Nigeria the same week. And then we ran into each other at a gallery, said hi, and then he walked past, walked on, and then he came back to me. He's like, Tayo, this was in, I think this was in 2010 or so. He's like, Tayo, I love what you're doing. And I want you to know that it's going to take a long time to get to the vision you have. And 10 years from now, people will call you an overnight success. They'll forget the 10 years you were building. He's like, and that's what happened with me with AOL. He's like, whack my words. Um, and that always stuck with me. And so for me, it has been, we've been really fortunate about the people on our team. From, you know, we've had people on my team now, people who have been on the team, who have poured themselves into this vision of how do we make financial freedom possible, right? Um, and, and that's really what has helped us. And just staying steady with the strategy and the approach that we're going on. Um, there's always one new name or the other. I mean, I've gone through it where my best is, oh, what about that company? What about that company? Let's just stay steady around what we're doing. Um, and it's been important for us in deciding what we do mm. and what we don't do. Because we could do many things, and we could be all, you know, can't be all things to everyone. So over the years, the direction and, the, and, and where we're going is the same, but how we've gone about has been a bit different. For example, if you had told me that the big part of our business by 2020 was an agent network, I would have been, no, that's not what we set out to do, right? We set out to build a consumer payments business where you're using your app by yourself, right? That was, that was the goal. Uh, but in 2014, we had to say, you know what? There is no way to KYC someone digitally. There was no BVN. There was no NIN. There was no digital voter ID. So we can't invest in that yet. And so, but we can invest in building this agent network. So let's do that. But we're going to come back to this. And we, did, we came back to that in 2020, right? Um, so we've been fortunate to have investors that, that have helped us do that. And as well as taking, the, we're playing an infinite game. We're playing a long game. We're not here to just make up some numbers and sort of get to something and then exit it, right? We're playing a long game and building a sustainable business. So my, my mention to the team always is that I want us to, my, my goal of success is that we build a business the last 200 years, right? It may be a standalone, it may be within another business, but to do that, we have to build sustainably. And so how do we, how do, we do that? So I think staying clear to your principles, staying clear with your team, really making sure that as a team you're together in how you build, and that includes not just the people that work in your company, but your investors, right, and your other stakeholders, I think is what's really helped us. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm thinking, it sounds like you've always had it really figured out. Has there been any mistakes that you've made that if you look back and you had to go 2009, you're like, I wouldn't have done this thing the exact same way. There's <laughs> so many. No, I make mistakes all, I make, I make mistakes all the time. Um, I think the first mistake actually, I think was around our series A. Um, we were well on our way to get the licenses in the UK to be an e-money issuer in the UK. Um, and then our investors asked us to pull back from doing that. I think that was a mistake. I think we should have done it. Um, because it's a huge remittance corridor, yeah. and I think we missed we missed that up. It, I think it's still going to be there for us to go after, but now it's a bit more crowded. Yeah. But it'll still be there. But I think we could have had a real early start in leveraging the remittance corridor. Um, so I think that was one mistake. The, the second mistake that really stands out to me is that you know when we finally in 2020 moved to focusing on the consumer direct side of the business, um, I was convinced that single use apps were what Nigerians would want. So we, you know, and there was a lot of debates in the company. Um, 
and I was uh, I was very firm about this, and I sort of put my foot down. We're gonna build a money transfer app. We're gonna build a bill payment. We're gonna build this, you know, and and so we launched the money transfer app. Put all the marketing out, etc., and then we started seeing the feedback was. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. I'm like, what is not working? This thing is working. <laughs> like, you know, you can send money to anyone with their phone number or email for free. Like, this is working. And so we we actually sat down and did over 500 calls, and I listened into some of these calls. And what people were saying was, on your website, I can do all of these things. I can't do it on the app. app. I was like, oh my god. So I literally had to raise my hand up in the entire company and say, I am sorry, I got that wrong. Um, and so we had to go back and rebuild. Actually, this was 2019. So I had to go back and rebuild and launch in December of 2019 the new app that had everything, and then now that's been great. So I think like those have been mistakes. The other mistakes that I, that I, another mistake that I think that I've made is being slow to fire. Uh, so when I know it's not working, um, I've been slow to fire. And um, and I think that's something that I'm working working on is like because I think you know within three months if a hire is like your first boss knew in three months. Like he knew in three months. <laughs> exactly. Actually, that's true. I never thought about that. But he knew it wasn't working, yeah. right? And he could have kept paying me, and be nice, right? But it would have been bad for me and actually really bad for them as well, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So I'm thinking, right? You've mentioned these three mistakes: slow to um, slow to firing. Um, in 2019, not building, or not first of all building like a multi-purpose app and just build one, um, and they're not getting the UK license. And I'm like, in retrospect, like, and people usually say that, you know, life is, is, is lived in retrospect. I can look back and say, I should have done that, right? Um, but if you take those lessons now, how do you, I'm trying to figure out how do we then know when to jump on opportunities like that? Yeah, that's the question, right? Because we can say, oh, I should have done, I should have said yes to that, I should have taken that risk, right? That's, it's easy to say I could have done that, but if I was going to translate that to an action point and I could do, how would, how would you do it now? How would you know when to say, my team is saying this, or I have this intuition and I should go for it, or I shouldn't go for it, or I should listen to my investors? How do you kind of translate that now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, first of all, you have to be comfortable in how you make decisions. So I am very comfortable with my gut feeling, like, and I really trust my gut feeling. And in fact, the moments where I've made mistakes is when I've not gone with my gut instinct right. in some way. That said, you can't live just by gut instinct with a company all the time. So I think the way to do it is to be very clear about your strategy, right? What is your vision? And what is the strategy? And, and then how, and the strategy is within your context and how you're going to evolve. So what I recommend to people is you should lay out your three to five year strategy and, and let that be crisp and clear to everyone in the, in the company. And then you have your, then the way we do it is we do a three to five year strategy and then we have an 18 month, which is in alignment with the wow. three to five years. And then any decision has to be in alignment with that. So I think it makes it easier to, even if you, so for example, like there's a decision that we were, that we, we just made that I think it's the right decision. I'm sort of okay, you know, maybe I don't wanna make, I don't wanna get that wrong. I think maybe it's too early, but everyone else around the room is like, we should do that now. Yeah. Um, and, but it's very much aligned with the strategy, right? Um, so I want to make sure that it's not only my voice, because then yeah, if it's just my voice again, too. then it's, yeah. So I want to make sure everybody's, everybody's engaged, everybody's involved. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a consensus decision, because I could, you know, ultimately, the way I look at it, everybody's got, you know, everybody's vote comes to 49% or 50%, I have 51, 51 yeah. or 49 Well, you 51. listen. But I listen, and then we, then I go generally with, yeah. with, the, with the general. What would you say has been the biggest lesson you've learned from your experience being an entrepreneur? If you are not in this for the long game, don't do it. Um, it is a lonely journey to be a founder. I mean, but there are lots of founders who are just oh raising my God. money now. No, no, you no. Know, it's a very lonely journey. And I, think, um, and I think it's a lonely journey anywhere in the world, right? Um, so I think you have to be, you have to really ask the question. I really love that session around the operators. Um, because, you know, I think we, you know, on one side, sometimes it's over glamorized to be a founder. Um, you know, the reality is like Paga exists because of the hundreds of people in Paga today. It's not because of Tayo, right? Like they are the ones who make it happen every day. Um, and it wouldn't exist if not for them. 
So I think it's important to also think about that. And if you look at some of the big tech companies in the world today, Microsoft, Cisco, uh, Apple, um, Google, the people leading these companies were not founders necessarily. They're the ones who are operating coming through in the business. So I think there's definitely a lot to be said about just building your skill, doing great work, um, and, you know, and learning where you are. The first person that invested in Paga was my former boss. The second person was a former boss, right? Um, and that gave a lot of confidence to other people who looked at it. So you worked with this guy mm. and you're putting your money. It really gave them a lot of confidence. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so I was, my next question was going to be, who are some of the people that have made the biggest influences in your life? I assume your former bosses. Yeah. I assume your mom as well. But are there other people, or maybe yeah. even books as well, that you say, because I came yeah. across this person, or read this book, or heard yeah. this thing, it has been one of the most pivotal things that has influenced how I live life? Yeah. Wow. A lot of people have, <laughs> a lot of people have really made a lot of influence to me. My mom, certainly. Um, and seeing her start so many businesses and sort of how she lived her life really influenced me. Um, you know, in terms of my former bosses, one of my former bosses, Hilton Romansky, um, was just a real big influence in my life. Um, and just seeing how he led people with empathy and how he um, gave you opportunity and you know, continue to give you more opportunity. And another boss of mine, Kevin Kelly, same thing. So those two bosses really, really stand out to me. Um, you know, and then on my journey in Paga, uh, there have been numerous people at different stages that have been very, very helpful to me. Like the top person I can think of right now is my business coach, uh, because I don't know how I could have gone through the pandemic without this woman. I mean, she has been amazing for me, right? Um, and so I also recommend you to have a coach or a mentor, right? And someone who cares about your success and who is willing to give you, to call your bullshit out, actually. Um, and, and really say, Tayo, I think this is, you know, how you should think about X, Y, Z. Um, and so she's been amazing. And, and I've loved that, having that relationship. Amazing. Thank you. I've, I've learned a lot. Something I like to do throughout my interviews is I like to see the things I've learned because it helps me and I think it helps the audience as yeah. well. I think the first one is that your mom sounds like a very awesome woman. Um, um, but, I, but I think when you said um, pick the paths that you thrive in, I think that really s resounds because yeah. Yeah. sometimes we want to do the things that are trending or the things that maybe even sound challenging, you know, things that other people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and But we forget that the places that we have the highest chance of success are the places that we just have a natural flair for and interest in. Correct. So I think that's, 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 like a, that's something I'm taking to say yeah. because sometimes I'm like, you know, I, I think it happens in tech. There was a time when I, I was considering, let me go and learn to code. Mm. And I tried, yeah. I'm like, see, it's still not for <laughs> me. Like, yeah. I would try, but I probably wouldn't really enjoy it. And it would exactly. just be much harder than something I already have a natural flair exactly. for. So I, I think that that's definitely the first one. Um, I think the other one is when you talk about decision making, mm. but not just like listening to your guts and listening to people. But making your decisions based on your long-term goals, yes. I, I think that's, yes. that's super important. Clarity on the long-term goals yeah. and the strategy is really important. And yeah. communicating that clearly. I almost wanted to ask the question, but it's the time. Um, but I, I take that. I, I also believe that clarity comes in doing. Mm -hmm. And at some times, you can say, hey, this is what I want to do. But as you keep doing it, it even like becomes much clearer. But just yeah. putting that focus that, hey, this is where I want to be, and use that as sort of like yeah. a benchmark mm -hmm. for how you make decisions now. I think that was super important as well. Yeah. And then just the fact that there's a lot of people that had influences in your life. Yeah. And we can never just overrate the experiences that we have and people. Yeah. And if I ever want to move back to Nigeria, I should have a bit of a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good one. Have um, a bit of a plan B, but I think make it hard to go back. Make it hard to go back. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my very final question is, I think you've shared a lot. I mean, shared your journey. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've known Paga, but it's when I do these sessions, I think I'm usually just really amazed by learning about the founders because mm. I feel like I know you much more now mm. and I can see how, how you think and who you are affect mm. how Paga has been built. Yeah. And that's like very impactful. Um, so in all of these stories that you shared, if there's one thing that you don't want every one of us here to forget about you, about Paga, about your story, mm. or just from the fact that we listen to you, yeah. what would that one thing be? I think it would be that um, myself, Paga as a company, we're on a mission. Um, and that mission is to bring financial freedom to Africa, starting here in Nigeria. And we really believe that what we're doing is making it, 
is, is really changing the country. And, and we were, you know, were and are on a mission to move people from a cash-driven society to a cashless society. And it's really about creating that uh, economic empowerment, uh, making it easier to do things, to drive innovation, right? Um, and, and that's what we're about. And we're on this mission. We're very fanatical about that mission. And, we're, and we want to just make it easy for everyone in this room and everyone who's listening so to be that. able to achieve the financial goals that they want. Amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. I, I really like thank just you. being mission driven and just focusing on that clear goal. Yeah. Taya, thank you so much for thank you. continuing me. Do we have pleasure. any questions? Wow. I didn't even finish it. Wow. <laughs> I will give the one person that raised their hand just one question. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Taya. Yeah, good okay, afternoon. So I, have, uh, so I have two questions. Um, so the question is around the mechanics of building your business. Because I know that part, I am trusting. I'm so sorry, I didn't hear you very well. I'm saying the question is around the mechanics okay. of like the moving parts for Got Paga, it. the mm -hmm. insider approach. So I'm saying, for example, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that Paga started maybe from a team of five or seven, I don't know. But I'm asking how, how did replication start from seven to 70 to 100 to 200? How does, what's the system around that? Then secondly, if you're replicating that fast, how is decision making? Where, how do you grant autonomy to people that, okay, I don't have to do anything here. You guys just do it and roll with it. So does that make mix yeah. around that? Great. Um, that's a really good question because as you build your businesses, you have to think very carefully about this. Um, you know, when we, you know, we got going, it was just me, right? Then the second person comes, the third person comes in. Um, the fourth person, I mean, and we're still able to all meet in one room. Even when we were 20 in the company, we'll meet together and everything is clear to everyone, right? But then as you start getting to like too big to fit into a room, you can't do that. Um, so you have to then start thinking about uh, how you communicate internally and also how you give authority to other people to make decisions. Because if every decision is coming through you, then you're not going to move very fast, right? Um, so I think as a founder, you have to start getting comfortable with um, dividing. And do I think of it as divide and conquer, right? Um, so if Jay is responsible for the agent network, yes, I want to know what's going on in the agent network, but I'm not the one making all the decisions around the agent network. I need to give him the autonomy. And I think in general, um, people want three things from any job. Um, and I think that first one is they want the autonomy to do good work. Um, I think they want to, in no particular order, I think they want to work on something bigger than any one of us, right? People want to pour their lives into something they believe in, right? Um, and then I think the third is they want to master their skills. I think this is true of anyone in any company and for all of us. So I think as a leader, if you focus on these three things for your team all the time, then you start really building the magic. Um, and, and you get comfortable as well with other people making decisions. Now, the thing is, we all decide on things differently. So how do we align so that the decisions are, you know, they might not be exactly the same, but they're within the line. I think it comes back to the clarity of your strategy. The clarity of strategy, so for example, we just came out of our retreat, and we're going as far as on one particular thing that we want to really change in the business or really not change, but more like focus on in the business. We're going as far as defining a question. And this question is what we want anybody to ask themselves when they're making decisions. And you know, if you can answer that question in a way that is, you're comfortable with, then we think you will make probably the right decision, right? So I think you just have to think of the, the mechanics that you use for decision making um, but you have to empower people. There's no other way. Um, I think if you, you know, it's just like which, you know, I, I use this example just as a way to think about it is that if you tell someone, I only expect this of you, that's what you're going to get. If you tell them you expect this of them, that's what you're going to get. Right? You know, so people move to what you expect of them as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. A round of applause for Tyre, please. <laughs>